we have partnered with tenants that are currently occupying a space. And because of our relationship, they want to continue to occupy the space. And so what we would do is we had, I'll give you an example. Last month, we closed on a building. The tenant had about six months remaining on the lease. And so the landlord didn't know that the tenant wanted to renew their lease. We knew it because we have a relationship with the tenant. Mm -hmm. And so we partnered with the tenant. And while we're under contract, we extend the lease for 15 years. So we literally execute a lease extension that is viable upon closing. Welcome to the Real Estate Mogul MD Podcast. Thanks for tuning in and taking control of your financial future. This is a show where we not only motivate and inspire, we give you actionable, real-world experience to help you live life by design. You'll hear journeys and stories from other physicians, investors, coaches, consultants, and entrepreneurs. And now, here's your host, Brett Riggins. Triple net lease. Absolute triple net lease. Net, net, net. What in the world is this all about? I hear about it all the time. I've been diving into it. I'm excited today about the conversation that we get to have with a 19-year veteran that specializes in triple net lease for commercial real estate. And not only is this triple net lease for commercial real estate, it is specifically um, medical, uh, retail, single tenant medical, single tenant retail. This is a wonderful conversation. I'm gonna dive in on the questions that I hear all the time when I speak with physicians and dentists about their practice, expanding their practice, uh, creating another uh, location for their practice. Today's guest is the CEO of Rooster Equity Partners. And this company is based in Austin, Texas. And man, it's just an exciting conversation about things I know that you have talked about and want to know more about. Everybody, please welcome Ben Kuget to the show. Ben, welcome to the show, man. How How is Austin today? Uh, Brett, thanks for having me. Austin is fantastic, hot as heck, but a uh, great market. Been here for 24 years and love it here. 24 years. Awesome. And you've probably seen some major changes down there. Is that um, kind of where you started in your journey in real estate investing? Yeah, I graduated from the University of Texas in, well, went there in 2000, graduated in 04, and I've been in commercial real estate ever since. Nice, nice. So that sounds like a little bit of a jump start of your background and who Ben is. Uh, with Rooster Equity. Tell us a little bit more about just a, a summary of, of your professional background. Yeah. Uh, after graduating college, uh, found some mentors who were selling big, brokering big shopping centers, triple net investment properties. And that's where I cut my teeth. Uh, we sold uh, countless numbers of shopping centers around Central Texas. And uh, then uh, went to get my MBA in 2010, 11, and uh, then got back into commercial real estate. And you know, wearing the uh, the uh, the hat as investor slash developer slash um, you know, pretty much anything I could do in the commercial real estate space. So that's really what I've been focused on and what I'm passionate about. So these shopping centers, then um, in this triple net lease world, uh, what is that? What does triple net lease mean to you for our listeners? So the definition for those that aren't familiar is triple net, the net, net, net of the taxes, insurance, and the maintenance costs are the, those are expenses, real expenses that are passed through to the tenant. So the tenant is responsible for paying the landlord their base rent. And then they also cover those other expenses. So from a landlord's perspective, we love it because you know, as taxes have gone up, obviously for year over year over year, especially here in central Texas. Um, it's not as much of a concern for us as a landlord because it's not our responsibility. It's the tenant's responsibility. And so it really helps us um, predict the cash flow and uh, all, all the other components of what's important in commercial real estate. And uh, that's one of the things that I love about it. So taxes, insurance, and maintenance. And that maintenance piece, Ben, is what what I see all the time is called TICAM. Well, the maintenance is the CAM part, right? The common area maintenance. So when Correct. we talk about maintenance being covered in a building, and a lot of our listeners are physicians, um, maybe in that triple net situation themselves or owning properties and renting them out in that way. When we talk about common area maintenance, what maintenance typically falls on the building owner then when we speak about common area maintenance or the maintenance of the building? Tell us a little bit about your experience with that. 
So it's a it's an it depends moment. So it depends on the lease, but in a medical uh, perspective, oftentimes let's just you know assume that it's a multi tenant medical facility. There's going to be landscaping needs. There's going to be uh, parking lot needs. There's going to be common area trash and water and all the things when windows break and roof leaks and lights on the parking lot and all those other things need to be maintained. And so the landlord will typically. So we hire a third party management to maintain it. And then at the end of the year, we will reconcile those expenses and every tenant dependent on their percentage of uh, occupancy in that particular project will be responsible for their percentage of the camp. Uh, but, but that's paid on a monthly basis though, or how yeah. does that, so you, so we will estimate forward. Oh, yeah. Estimate. So, yeah. So we'll, it, it's two parts. So, uh, at the beginning of the year, let's say February or March, we're going to do two things. We're going to look backwards and see, you know, we had made an estimate last year what those expenses were going to be. How did it compare? And you, it's, you never hit it right on the penny. So there's going to be either the, the landlord owes the tenant or the tenant owes the landlord, depending on how those shook out. And then you reset what the triple nets are going to look like for the next year. And so then this is a process that happens year over year. And then you divide that into 12 months so that the tenant can um, you know, budget accordingly. Well, basically like an escrow account when you're escrowing on a mortgage payment. Basically, yes. Interesting, interesting. And then uh, again, another depends moment, but it, generally speaking, what about the, the structure itself? If we say common area maintenance, what all happens um, when it comes to like maintenance of the roof and the the maybe the framing piece of, of the building? Is that is that the tenant or is that the the landlord so if it's if it's a let's say it's a single tenant building lots of times it'll be a triple net lease and they uh lease will carve out that the roof of the structure becomes the responsibility of the landlord and also the foundation so but also there are leases that we've um we've purchased where it's an absolute triple net where no matter what the expenses roof foundation anything it doesn't matter to us as the landlord, it's the tenant's responsibility. So it really, uh, it depends on that situation. And then what are some steps that you do to mitigate your risk because somebody else is caring for your asset, right? How do you cover your asset in that situation? Nice. I like that. So we will require <laughs> that the uh, tenant uh, puts together a um, a maintenance, like a common maintenance uh, package with you know, let's say a roof, for example, they should have annual inspections on the roof and they'll be responsible for providing us with those types of inspections. Um, really not nothing to do with a foundation per se, but we, we I like to personally either personally or we have people check in on the properties on a regular basis to make sure that everything is being maintained. But also it's, you know, the tenants are typically signing long-term leases. So they're going to be motivated to make sure that their own spaces are maintained as well. And trust me, when things don't go, you know, well, you, we're going to hear about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, I want to dive in a little bit more on your experience, Ben, in the medical world in this triple net lease, because I have a lot of conversations about, uh, physicians looking to either grow their practice, start their practice, expand their practice, and um, now kind of partnering in this with this real estate investor side of their attention as well. How how does that look for you and your experience with uh, physicians or dentists that uh, you know want to be a real estate investor and want to expand their practice? Okay, so great question. I've I've worn this hat on every side of this equation. Uh, my dad happened to be a dentist, so I grew up around the space. Um, I have many, many dentists who um, want to just be a passive investor, so they can just invest in the project and we handle everything. And let me share with you another formula that we've done many times where, to your point, this um, we're going to use a uh, urgent care as an example. They wanted to expand. And so what we did is we partnered with the urgent care and they would point out to a, um, where well, we would together, we'd find out a location where they wanted to go. And so then we would put the uh, project under contract and then we would come in and we would buy the real estate and we would fund their, um, their tenant improvement. So maybe they need to renovate it, paint it, you know, maybe they need some working capital and we basically bundle all that cash together. So I'll just give you an example. Let's say it's a million and a half dollar building. 
Okay. And they need, uh, they need to buy the, they want to own the, occupy the building, but they also need, let's say, I'll make up a number, a million dollars for equipment and working capital and marketing and so on and so forth. Um, or maybe even they need that money to buy the practice that's in that particular facility to help them expand. And so now we're into this building for two and a half million. So now the tenant, the doctor will sign a lease with us. And they can either participate on the LP, they can be a partner in the project, or they can just be a tenant. It's up to them. And um, they can come in and sign. Usually it's about a 15 to 20 year triple net lease at a pre-negotiated uh, cap rate. So they're going to basically be, it's, it's, a, it's a creative way to finance uh, the expansion for these medical facilities. And so I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. Does that make sense? Did that lose you there? So when you said um, a predefined cap rate, so they're going to come in as a LP, a limited partner, and they're going to tell me a little bit more about what that predefined cap rate mean with relation to them as an investor, as opposed to just being a tenant. So uh, let's first look at it from the tenant perspective. So your question to me was how can how can they use this as a, as a tool to um, to expand? So let's 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 just focus on them as a tenant, and then I'll explain about how they could also be uh, an okay. investor on it. So from a tenant perspective, so they're in it for two point five million because it's a million and a half dollars to buy it, and then another million for whatever. So two and a half million. Let's say that um, we and I'm just going to make up a number. Let's say it's an eight and a half cap. So you take two and a half million times point oh eight five, and so that means that they're going to be responsible for two hundred twelve thousand dollars of uh, rent annually, which is about 17,000 and some change per month. And so now they have gotten the ability to expand. They've gotten a million dollars to use and we'll negotiate what that money is used for, but you know, for their facilities, they didn't have to go to a bank to go and borrow the million bucks because they're basically going to amortize those expenses into the rent over the next, let's say 15 or 20 years, that kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah. that's, I'll pause there. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So that's interesting piece. I don't know of anyone, I've not spoken with anybody else that, that takes that angle. And that's what, that's what Rooster Equity is doing, correct? Yeah. So we like to partner with the tenant so that our interests are aligned and, um, and also we'll structure a deal. So let's say we'll take that one step further. The tenant wants to be an owner in the real estate as well. So they can, They'll be paying rent as a tenant, but also they want the benefits that come with the tax benefits and the cash flow. And so they will come into our partnership with Rooster Equity to whatever extent they want with their own capital and become an LP, knowing that they're also the tenant. Mm -hmm. So they, they're very motivated to continue to pay the rent for the, you know, for the entirety of it. And then, at, you know, we'll hold it for probably, we can negotiate. Like if they want to hold it forever, we'll, we'll do that. We'll structure that. But oftentimes we're going to aim for like two to five years of holding this type of real estate. And then there's a robust market of investors that like to buy medical triple net investment properties. And this one will have, let's say we do a 20 year lease. We were, you know, we own it for five years. It still has 15 more years on the lease. It's been seasoned for five years. And there's a lot of uh, investors who would like to, to acquire that type of real estate. Interesting. Very interesting. That's cool. And what kind of, I guess, what's the most common opportunities that you see in this type of relationship so far? Just um, to, to kind of to what you were alluding to earlier, that there are um, medical professionals who are now learning because of, you know, podcasts like yours about the benefits of also being, um, you know, on the, on the landlord side, you know, my dad's a dentist and he owned his dental condo for, uh, over 40 years that he operated out of. And so at the end, he had some equity in that real estate that he was able to unlock when he retired a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And so there's nothing wrong with being a tenant all these years. There's a lot of benefits of just being a tenant, not having to worry about a lot of things as well. But what we're trying to do is, is, is educate people about the ability to, you can have your cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That Very cool. Um, how did you get into the medical world then from the shopping piece into the medical world? Is that related to your father being a dentist? No, it's just that a lot of medical space, you know, it used to be back in the day that medical space was primarily in medical offices, which we do also invest in medical office buildings. But um, what you see now 
is a lot of medical groups that are occupying retail space. You know, shopping centers, you know, people said, oh, you know, retail is dead, Amazon and this and that. And it's like, no, retail is not dead. You can drive around in the Carolinas or really anywhere in the United States, and you're going to see that retail space, you know, and here in Austin, it's 97% occupied. And it's because you're not going there to go shopping, but you're going there to go get your, you know, dent, your teeth cleaned, or you're going for, you know, an urgent care because you cut something or you have your nails done or you have, you know, grocery and those types of things. And so retail, uh, you know, during COVID, retail is a scary thing. But now it's it's probably one of the hottest you know subcategories of commercial real estate, mm-hmm. and so we have seen time and time again that this is uh, this is what's happening. I mean, you're seeing medical groups getting uh, rolled up into big corporate organizations, and a lot of them love being front and center with visibility, which is where retail typically is to the masses, cars driving by, and that you know with these big flashy brands, and you know like we didn't used to see all these big uh, dental brands, but now like they're all getting rolled up as corporate entities. Yeah. There's just, there's something that cannot be replaced by this idea that the brick and mortar is gone is the fact that you got to be touched by someone at some point and you cannot do that, you know, over the internet. So there's certain, um, practices and trades that just will not be, uh, removed and they have to have that location inside of these locations. Ben, what, when you say, um, blend and extend the lease. What is that? Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So what we did um, is we we have um, partnered with tenants that um, are currently occupying a space, and they um, because of our relationship, they want to continue to occupy the space. And so what we would do is we had. I'll give you an example. Last month we closed on a building. The tenant had about six months remaining on the lease. And so the landlord didn't know that the tenant wanted to renew their lease. We knew it because we have a relationship with the tenant. Mm -hmm. And so we partnered with the tenant. And um, while we're under contract, we extend the lease for 15 years. So we literally execute a lease extension that is viable upon closing. And in exchange, we provide the tenant with capital that they can use, really they can use it for whatever they want, but they're going to be using it for fixing up their space, new carpet, new paint, refreshing the space. And so it's a tool for them that the the previous landlord did not want to provide them with any any capital. And so we're coming in, we're recapitalizing the real estate. We're going to buy the real estate. We're going to give the tenant, you know, quite a bit of capital and exchange So that's the, that's the blend part. And then the extend part is in exchange. They're going to extend their lease for another 15 years. They're going to go from, uh, well, it was a double net, but now they're a triple net lease. And so it provides us with the stability. And then I go to my, um, rooster equity partners. The investors will come in. They all get to invest in it and have a slice of ownership in the project. They're all passive. I'm, you know, and then. You know, we just cash flow this thing. And so there's a lot of tax benefits to that. And, you know, I'll have to tell you about all that, but it's a, it's a way to mitigate the risk and provide the tenant. It's a win, win, win. The, the tenant gets what they want. They want some capital and they're happy staying there. Uh, we get a long term lease with a great tenant that's stable and our investors get to participate and know that uh, the deal is cash flowing on day one. We make monthly distributions out of the cash flow. And, you know, it's a great way for them to get a really strong risk adjusted return that um, we can just cash flow for as long as we want. How do you handle the that recapitalization of, of the real estate? Does it go into an escrow and then they make draw requests uh, similar to like a renovation or how do you how do you mitigate the risk in that process? So it's as simple as um, we close on the real estate. That's our money. That doesn't go to the tenant. That goes to the, the previous owner of the real estate. So they go away. And then because we had already negotiated and signed a lease extension, um, our agreement is very clear. We pay them cash. They sign a new lease. And once that happens, then we're, you know, that's how it happens. We wire them the money and that's it. So it's, there's no uh, like handholding in that they're actually investing in the real estate. 
this is not a scenario where the tenant is an investor in the real estate. They're just they're no, just not getting I mean, a tenant. The repairs themselves. So if, so if you're recapitalizing the real estate and you're saying that hey, I'm going to you know put fifty, eighty, hundred thousand into floors, walls, equipment, whatever it may be, that there's no follow through on that for you as a building owner for them to do that. No, we don't. We don't even care. Yeah. We're giving them you know hundreds of thousands of dollars. They can you know use. 10,000 of it to fix the floors and they keep 190 of it in their bank. And they have, uh, you know, 15, 14, 15 more years of lease. They're going to need that money to make repairs along the way. And now that we're an absolute triple net lease, we don't care as a landlord. It's not our responsibility. And they have, they've gotten their money and, and they can use it either now or later. It doesn't matter to us. And the absolute triple net lease works because it's a single tenant, single occupied building. Correct. Yeah, that's correct. Interesting. So, and it doesn't matter because it on paper and the income coming in, that's where the value of the building is, not necessarily in the, the walls being painted or the, the floors being um, new. When you extend these leases, yeah. two questions I have there, Ben, is how are you executing something? So you have equitable interest in the property, but you don't have the right to execute lease agreements with them. So how does that work where you're extending prior to having the ability to sign a lease? It's contingent upon us closing on and acquiring the real estate. Okay. So it's just as easy, simple as that. Interesting. Um, yeah. And then when you sign something like that, how, what, what's your process for mitigating the risk with the tenant themselves when, you know, say, okay, I'm going to increase your rent, you know, 5,000 uh, um, a month or, you know, I, I know you don't go by that way, but I'm going to add an additional expense to this business. What, how are you mitigating your risk by looking at that business to see if it's going to withstand that additional expense? Great question. So that that's probably one of the most important questions that I like to dig into is what is the abil- the tenant's ability to be able to pay this rent? Can they afford this rent? Uh, and so to do that, we look at the unit economics the basic fundamentals of the financials of the tenant. And so if it's a mom and pop medical tenant, we like to see like if it's a dentist, as an example, looking at their financials, can they afford this rent? How does it compare to what their rent was before? Um, and we're going to try to keep it uh, minimal. So like somewhere between five and 10% um, rent bump. Um, and then the example I've been talking about is, was a national group. So it was a uh, backed by a multi-billion dollar private equity group. And so when we have that, and, and look, there's no guarantees that even a, a billion you know, dollar companies don't go belly up, but we dug into it and we, you know, there, there's a lot of information about these uh, guarantors. And so we were able to be confident that uh, this tenant can handle the, the lease guarantee. So um, it's much more difficult when it's a, when it's a mom and pop or like a, you know, if it's a couple of units versus, you know, a multi-billion dollar or a publicly traded or credit tenant or something like that. But that is, um, that is the most important question. Who is this tenant? Who is the guarantor? Can they afford to do this deal with us? And we want to make sure that we have that confidence before we, you know, purchase and, and execute on this lease extension. And when you look at the financials, are you looking at like just the T12? Or are you asking for, you know, two years, three years of P&Ls? Yes. So in commercial real estate, it's, it's got to be more than just the last 12 months. I mean, that's that's very much like a multifamily mentality. Like we're, we're looking at the business itself, the bottom line. And uh, yeah, for the last, you know, as many years back as we can go. And we're also going to look for the projections going to the future. Interesting. Very cool. And now you're doing this with Rooster Equity and you've got um, more information on your website, roosterequity.com. You actually have an interesting book there as well, too. So you could go roosterequity.com forward slash book and get this book as well. Tell us a little bit. What is this? Congratulations. First of all, there's a book that you're giving out um, because one that takes a lot of real life experience to put something like that together. And then it takes time to build it and put it on a platform where you can disperse it as well too. So congratulations on that. Tell us a little bit about this book. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, it's called Mission Matters. And it's uh, the top lessons that I've learned on this journey of investing in commercial real estate. 
it is it is a niche. I don't hear as many people talking about it, and so I wanted to uh, boil it down. And you know, wrote this book and created all this marketing stuff. But you know, it's uh, it's it for me. It's fun to be able to educate people, and I'd already always wanted to write a book, and so. Uh, last year, I said, you know what, time to do it. And so that's what we did. And I'm also on the website, um, you offer these opportunities for other investors. So I know there's a lot of physicians out there, um, doctors, dentists, you know, healthcare professionals that want to invest in real estate. And what a great way to do it through an LP situation where you learn about the general partners, you learn about the process, um, you learn about the practice. So what is a way that the listeners could learn more about what Rooster Equity is um, through the website and how they can invest with you? What kind of stuff you got going on right now? Yeah, sure. So roosterequity.com, sign up for our investor club. Um, you're, you're basically going to deal with me. So you're going to get to know me personally. We're going to have a Zoom conversation. I mean, that this whole thing is about relationships. And um, we're, our goal is to put out a new uh, opportunity every other month. And the goal is to have long-term lease, great tenants, uh, monthly cash flow, and um, yeah, I mean they're all they all stand on their own. And we've done uh, over forty of these so far, and we're just uh, trying to make sure we you know take care of the investors along the way and and take care of everybody along the way. So just just basic fundamentals mm-hmm. of uh, commercial real estate investing. And for the listeners out there, take a look at this. Are you raising, what types of raises are you doing? Are you doing um, non-accredited and accredited? Or tell me a little bit about who can invest. Uh, yeah, accredited investors only. Uh, we I also have my own fund set up. And so it's a customizable fund. So the investors can pick and choose where their capital is allocated. It's not my job to do that. I mean, I will, I will help them along the way and I will, you know, share with them about the pros and cons of what we're working on. Um, but really, ultimately, it comes down to the individual investors and what their preferences and, you know, timing, and risk tolerance and all those typical things are. Yeah. When when you, you talk about this customizable fund where you can choose where the where the money is going, what properties, what assets these are being allocated to, does the depreciation still tag along in that fund? Uh, set up. Yep, it's all passed through. Uh, just it's all determined on what they're, however much they invested, and you know we'll have typically depends on the deal, but typically uh, we'll do a uh, third party cost egg study so we can figure out what the depreciation benefits look like, and the investors will get their portion of those tax losses. Nice, nice, very good. And Ben, if you could go back, say ten years, and set beside somebody that's on the similar path as you. Maybe that's in, um, you know, prior to getting into the medical, but definitely in that commercial triple net kind of world. What's knowing what you know now, what's something that you would tell that other person 10 years ago that that kind of, you know, is like hitting your trigger these days? Well, you know, going back and I should have bought a lot more of the things that we passed on. Uh, But practically speaking, you know, I've been, you know, fostering relationships over the last 20 years of my career. And I wish that I had done a better job of tracking them or like basically creating like a a database that I can continue to be in touch with people. It's only until recently that I started, um, you know, doing a better job with that. And I think that um, there's a lot of people who, uh, you know, reach out to me after the fact, after a deal's closed. They're, oh, if I had known that that was a deal you're doing, I would have jumped in. And so they miss out on that, but they they ultimately get in. But um, I think that at the end of the day, the real estate business is the relationship business. And um, that there's nothing more important than that from the investor side, from the tenant side, and everything in between. And so building those relationships and maintaining them is uh, is always a uh, difficult because uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of people to maintain with, but that that's what I would focus. On. Yeah, yeah, that's great, great advice, and I've heard that many, many times, and it's definitely building inside of me that real estate is the relationship business, and it's tough because it's business too. So when you're building a relationship and you're building a business, sometimes those things just don't go together. Um, so that's a whole nother conversation, a whole nother show on, on those ones that don't work. And then now like looking back, did they, were they supposed to, was it me? What could I have done differently? 
But great advice, Ben. And uh, thank you for your time. Again, roosterequity.com, laying the stuff out. And I, I hear this so often with physicians and dentists talking about the real estate, how that is related to the practice. How can we bring those both together? And what a beautiful way um, to learn by expanding your associations uh, and jumping on that roosterequity.com website to connect with you, to learn the process. Um, what's the purpose? How are we doing this? It's just a great opportunity. Thanks for your time today, Ben. I appreciate you very much, Brett. Thanks. Awesome. And to the listeners out there today, as always, thank you for your time and even more importantly, your attention, because without the, that attention, the time is just wandering um, and disappearing on us. So um, thank you for giving us that attention today. Don't hesitate to reach out. I hear this all the time. How can we tie real estate um, together with the practice? Learn more about this at roosterequity.com. Uh, reach out to us here at the Real Estate Mogul MD. Uh, shoot us an email. And until next time, this is Brett. This is the Real Estate Mogul MD.